Hi everyone, um, welcome to this event, um, which focuses on how we can build our future together. Um, so the focus of this event is to share best practice and to think about inclusive policy making for global climate action. It's an opportunity to explore the insights from the Global Science Partnership, which is a global science and public engagement um, network that brings academic and research community, policymakers, civil society and the public's perspective together to spark more effective and more inclusive climate action. And we have a really great list of speakers here today um, and we'll, we'll be bringing them um, on, on board to join us um, throughout this event. So just briefly introducing them all, uh, we've got Dr Sarah Honour, who is Deputy Director of Climate Science and Research at the UK's Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. We have Rachel Brisley, who is an Ipsos Director, Head of Energy and Environment. We have Claire Devan from the World Bank, Climate Governance in Sub-Saharan Africa Specialist. Um, and we have Elizabeth Adobe Uprosa, Soil Scientist um, from Calro, uh, Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization. We have Daniela Manzo, who joins us from um, Minty Enters, who are a Colombian um, Technology and Innovation Ministry. We also have Kevin Nancy with us, Principal Secretary, Department of Agriculture um, at the Seychelles Government, and Richard Smithers, Technical Director of Ricardo. And Ricardo are a partner with Ipsos in supporting in the delivery and the convening of Global Science Partnership. Um, so that's enough from me. Um, what we want to do is share a video um, which, which briefly introduces the work that the partnership has done before we move on to, to our speakers. So um, uh, yes, if, if the RSA could please share the video, I'd appreciate it. The Global Science Partnership was launched by the UK COP2026 Presidency in 2021 and aims to turn climate commitments into science-based and citizen-focused action. Climate policymaking can be more effective and impactful when combining the expertise of policymakers, experts and citizens at an early stage in its development. But how do we implement this kind of inclusive policymaking for climate action? The Global Science Partnership have developed and tested a six-step inclusive policymaking process for climate action. 1. Defining a policy question. Begin with identifying and defining your policy challenge and related policy questions. 2. Expert engagement. Invite technical experts, scientists, researchers and civil society organisations to bring in their scientific expertise and research to address the challenge. 3. Focused research studies. Gather secondary data from a variety of sources to address evidence gaps that are related to the policy question. 4. Citizen engagement. Citizen engagement contributes towards answering the policy question, ideally on an issue that explores diverse perspectives, values and norms. Focus on how to balance trade-offs or difficult choices at a local level and explore barriers. 5. Policy recommendations. Outcomes from the research, stakeholder engagement and citizen engagement are combined to provide actionable recommendations that address the policy question identified at the start of the process and agreed by stakeholders. 6. Continuous learning and feedback. Throughout the process, it is important to identify what has gone well and what hasn't, so that the process is continually improving as it is implemented. Together, science, stakeholder engagement and citizen engagement form a feedback loop that helps shape and inform policy making. To find out more on how to use inclusive policy making as part of your own research, please visit our website. We have a comprehensive toolkit you can use to get started. Thank you. So I would like to briefly uh, turn to Dr. Sarah Honor. Um, who, as I mentioned already, is the Department for Energy Security Net Zero Deputy Director for Science, Climate Science and Research, um, just to make a few opening remarks um, about the project. Brilliant, thank you for that, Rima. And thank you also for that amazing video, which I think really encapsulates everything that this project is about in just a few, few short minutes. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about why we as UK set up the partnership and why we, why we really believe in what we're trying to achieve here. 
So as the video said, we, we, we launched this as part of our COP26 um, presidency legacy um, with the three really important aims. The first was to actually try and support some of the outcomes from COP26, thinking very much about how we support ourselves and countries in developing long-term mitigation, adaptation and resilience strategies based on the best available evidence. Um, secondly, I think, and this is I think what makes this project quite unique, is, is we're very interested in taking forward how you combine scientific evidence as a scientist myself, this is something that's very dear to my heart, but also insights from citizens and how you combine that to really inform ambitious climate action. And thirdly, I think we wanted to demonstrate that actually you can come up with some really effective solutions to climate challenges though in policymaker is done inclusively and that those solutions can be both feasible and what citizens themselves want. So just to say a little bit more about, I think, why we feel it's really important to combine research and citizen engagement. I think this is because we know that when you do that, you get more effective and inclusive policymaking. When people are engaged in climate issues, they're much more empowered to influence policy development um, and to actually embrace the solutions that come out of it. When you um, engage scientists, they help to identify evidence gaps and find out additional evidence um, that can really improve policy outcomes um, through evidence-based decision-making. This is an approach that, that's been growing and, and increasingly implemented around the world. In the UK ourselves, we did something around very similar to this in 2020 when we set up our UK Citizens' Assembly, which engaged over 100 citizens to hear evidence around the different choices that the UK faces around how we can actually reach our net zero 2020, um, 2050 target. But this event is actually very much about the Global Science Partnership Project itself. And I'm really pleased to be here to celebrate that the work that the partnership has done, the work that's been through, um, delivering the three pilots um, in Colombia, the Seychelles and Kenya, and developing this really important inclusive policymaking toolkit that we're launching today. Um, and this methodology is really important because it, firstly, it's really built on those principles of combining scientific evidence and citizen engagement to address policy challenges. But also it's really embedded in the genuine experiences of pilot countries themselves. This isn't something that's an academic exercise. This has been tried and tested in the real world. And finally, it's something that's scalable and shareable for others to use and to pick up across the world. So it hasn't always been the easiest project in the world to deliver, um, to be honest, but when you're doing something new, it's always going to be difficult. So I really wanted to thank everyone involved in the project for all their hard work and dedication. And I think the toolkit that we're launching today is a really amazing synthesis of everyone's experience, their work and all their learning that's gone into this project. I'm particularly grateful to our pilot countries because without their work, I think we wouldn't really have this toolkit we have at all. Um, but also to our non-pilot countries, Italy and Jamaica for their input and support in developing the process. And most of all, what I'm looking forward to is what we're doing here today, which is actually launching that toolkit and seeing how we can work with others around the globe to actually you know, embed this in policymaking, how we can then use this to deliver more effective and inclusive solutions to the climate challenges that we, we all face today. So with that, I'll hand back to Rima. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much, um, Sarah, for, for those remarks. And one of the things that Sarah mentioned was the idea of a scalable and shareable methodology. So we've learned a lot through this process. And um, one of the things that we want to share with you is how um, to embark upon such process in, in your different cultural contexts and settings. So I'll hand on to Rachel Brisley, who um, is my colleague at IPSOR um, uh, and head of energy and environment at IPSOR, who will be able to share a little bit more about the methodology itself. Thanks, Rima. OK, so thanks very much for that. We've um, just shown you a video there about the methodology, but this was just literally to just explain it a little bit more as, as where that was quite a whistle stop tour. So the partnership as a whole is, is as we as, as has been um, shown in the video and, and mentioned by Sarah on, on a, is about engaging citizens and stakeholders to develop inclusive pathways to climate resilience and net zero. Um, interesting in terms of learning, the project actually started focused just on net zero, but particularly with um, discussion with countries in the global south, we brought climate resilience in, in too. 
Um, and I think in terms of what's different about this to other policy making is, is most a lot of policy making in countries across the world does involve an element of um, engagement or consultation with citizens and also the in inputs from academics or scientists. But here it was doing it at an early stage. So it's not about oh, here's a draft policy. We're now consulting on it. It's more here's a problem. Um, how are we going to how are we going to look to address this and by bringing the the citizens and uh, the scientists together. So, as mentioned, it was established as part of the COP26 um, uh, UK presidency in Glasgow, uh, launched in uh, a year later. And it's got those three primary objectives about advancing global knowledge by combining scientific evidence with citizens views. Uh, to inform climate policy, developing a scalable methodology that can be applied any, anywhere in the world, and also creating a lasting impact and legacy for both climate policy and deliberative engagement globally. So whilst this project is, is, is getting towards the end for us, it's actually really just the beginning in terms of this methodology being available. And so highlighting again here is a scalable methodology which combines policy specialist and citizen expertise across those six stages um, there, as, as explained in the video. And in the middle, you can see that continuous learning and feedback, which has been really important and, and which um, Richard Smithers and from Ricardo and I will come to, to discuss at the end. So we focused, um, we looked at a particular theme for the for the pilot project. So it was looking at net zero and climate resilient food systems. Um, we had pilots in Colombia and, and Seychelles and Kenya is just embarking on that to actually test this methodology further. Um, so we're looking at livestock in Colombia, particularly agriculture in Seychelles and Kenya is looking at climate uh, smart technologies and the data needed for those. And it's been overseen by an international steering group that engaged representatives in Italy and the United Kingdom. Uh, so that's just a quick overview before we move on to the uh, other speakers. So I'll just pass back to you, Rima. Hi, so thank you. Yes, yeah, so a six step process and I can see a couple of people have asked about the toolkit, which will be launched later today. So that will be available on the Global Science Partnership website um, and uh, we will share links to that and other resources very shortly. Um, and in terms of other questions, uh, do send them in and we do have time for a Q&A slot in, in due course. Um, so as Rachel and Cher, we've got this methodology or six step process um, and there's just something really interesting about how that's being deployed in different contexts in different um, uh, settings. And um, so what we've got is a great lineup of speakers from around the world who will be able to speak to their approach to, to um, this, this methodology. The first um, speaker I want to turn to is Claire Devan from the World Bank, who is focusing on climate governance in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, Claire's experience um, working on, on similar approaches um, will be really useful to help set us up for a conversation about pilot projects in Kenya, Seychelles and Colombia specifically. So over to you, Claire. I'm really interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, Rima. Thank you, Sarah. I'm very excited to be here today to present three cases that I, I found great inspiration in. I've been designing uh, citizen engagement initiatives for the World Bank for a few years. And um, of course we have lots of European examples, American examples and so on and so forth. And oftentimes the officials uh, I work with in the global south, they, they, they do ask us for specific cases in contexts that are very much similar to theirs. So um, I've been looking, in, uh, looking at uh, examples in the global south and on the African continent alone, I found three really remarkable cases of citizen engagement, um, sometimes very technical issues, whether financial literacy or um, having to do with climate change. And so um, next slides, please. I'll be speaking of those um, three cases. So the first one was in Mali in 2006. Um, it was about organizing a citizen's jury of farmers on the future of agribusiness. And specifically, they were put uh, to the test of making um, informed decisions about whether they wanted their country to allow GMOs um, to, be, uh, to be legal in the future of the farming of their country. And so uh, 40, 45 ordinary farmers were selected to debate the pros and cons of, of this issue. Um, and um, they were uh, exposed to a lot of content. They were exposed to content uh, from people that are in favor of it. 
um, and also against it. Um, and uh, they were pondering the risks and the advantages. It took several weeks or several months. I don't exactly remember, but uh, the, these groups of people that were very well um, facilitated um, by scientists, by a development specialist, um, academia, uh, got together uh, several times and debated. And what is very interesting in this case uh, is that um, Mali, the government, uh, say, took this example, this exercise as a very serious uh, policy making exercise because after this, the, the policy orientation of the country was shaped. Um, there was even a movie about it uh, in 2007. Uh, it was a pretty remarkable case of ordinary citizens being facilitated uh, in their debates and exposed to a lot of content, making their own minds and formulating influential recommendations, which are still followed to this day by the government. And um, well, they were not, not in favor of, of, of GMOs. Uh, they decided they decided against. So that's the first case that I wanted to share with you. Um, the second case is, um, in Malawi in 2020, this is uh, for those who have a citizen engagement background in participatory budgeting, this is very similar. They organized citizens juries. Um, sorry, so if I didn't say it, next slide, yes, thank you. Um, they organized citizens juries in district at the local level to decide over the allocation of, um, of local funds and the management of those local funds. And so in order to do so, they were also exposed to a lot of uh, content for budget literacy, for um, uh, you know, uh, guidelines and information on the, on the performance of previous projects in their areas. Um, and they had to learn a lot of things um, and decide over the, 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 the next you know, uh, cycle of, of, of investment at the local level. And, where those funds uh, should be allocated. So this is also a very interesting case, um, a little more, let's say, uh, typical to what we can see in, in countries with participatory budgeting, for instance, in Kenya, where this is happening in a lot of counties already. Um, and nonetheless, this has a, this is an interesting case of, of you know, ordinary citizens being exposed to content, uh, being facilitated in their debates and making their own mind about wh where the funds should go. This also has a lot of um, great effects on transparency, on um, oversight, citizen oversight of, of budgets and, and, uh, and uh, where the money goes um, for, for local development. Um, and the third case that I uh, want to spend a bit more time on, which I think is the most interesting one, um, the one that I found most inspiration for some of the citizen engagement initiatives that I'm designing in, in Mozambique at the moment is um, an example from 2015 in Tanzania. Um, they, they, were, they were wondering, they wanted to put to the test the question of whether exposing citizens, exposing citizens to a lot of content versus no content would really help change their mind or if it's the process of deliberation that really impacts whether citizens change their mind about an issue or not. And so that's what they tested in on this, um, you know, in this in this instance. And so the Center for Global Development and Stanford University ran this, this exercise in, in two phases. The first phase was to randomly select 2000 people and ask their opinion about the topic of natural resources. So these citizens were, let's say, normally informed or usually informed on this matter. And uh, the second phase of this, this, this test was to um, select part of these 2000 people who responded and uh, randomly select them, stratify them and um, expose them to content and also expose them to deliberation processes. So um, they would be exposed to content from specialists, from uh, academia, from uh, business people on the matter of natural resources. And they were put into sessions where they would debate all together on whether or not um, they were in favor of a type of natural resources management or another one. 
And what was interesting, what's interesting in this case is that at the end, um, the result of this is that not only citizens were really well informed um, on, on, the, on the matter of natural resources in their own country, but also um, this, this proved that actively participating in deliberative exercises is more effective at shaping opinions in one way or another than in just passively receiving information. So that's, in, that's very important to know as a government when you are thinking of expanding, for instance, communication uh, campaigns, uh, thinking maybe citizens are not well informed about an issue or another. Uh, and so maybe we should expand those campaigns on online, offline, and so on. But actually knowing that what's most effective, and that's just a case in Tanzania in 2015, but Stanford University has run a lot of tests in a lot of countries in the world. That's just one, one example. But the conclusions are always similar, is that it's really about um, what's most effective at shaping a citizen's opinion is, is not their background, uh, whether or not they're educated or even literate. It's really about how their debate or conversation um, is facilitated and deliberated. And that is the most effective way to, um, to have citizens uh, form an opinion, an informed opinion. It's not the amount of content that's available out there online, offline, on TV, on radio. It's really facilitating those conversations. And so that, that gives us a lot, a lot to think about. And um, one of the things that we've been thinking about, for instance, is that, um, you know, that, that gives us ammunition, if I, if I may say, if I may use this expression, to, to, to say that the assemblies, citizen assemblies, for instance, um, are complicated to organize, they're costly, they take a lot of expertise and time, but potentially citizen assemblies are a lot more effective ha at um, having citizens decide on a, on a public issue, even when it's very technical, even when participants are not literate or have no background in, in, in economics or any of those technical issues, a lot more effective than having a survey or a poll out there um, in the population. So I think those three examples for me have really helped me understand how to be more effective at designing um, citizen engagement um, uh, activities, initiatives. And I try to defend this in my work at the World Bank, um, you know, trying to um, get people on the side of, uh, you know, having science on our side and, and saying that this is the most effective way for a government to, to get informed policymaking um, that's inclusive of citizens' views. So, um, I think I think I, I try to be as concise as possible. Um, I'll, I'll leave the floor to to my colleagues. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And um, just to say that we have examples as well now from the Global Dive Partnership pilot. So I will hand on to Daniela um, Manzano um, from from the Colombian um, Ministry, um, the Technology and Innovation Ministry in Colombia. So um, over to you, Daniela. Thank you so much, Rima. Uh, so for this project, uh, we had a main policy question that was um, about uh, how we, uh, through the policy of social appropriation of knowledge, could identify or could support the construction and adoption of comprehensive managers, management systems, which allows achievement and sustainability of livestock landscapes while achieving neutrality in carbon emissions and food security and resilience to climate change. For this, first of all, this research was conducted by Ricardo in collaboration with the Ministry of Science and Technology of Colombia uh, to identify relevant local, regional and international cases and studies. So in Colombia, to achieve this, a uh, citizen participation workshop uh, were facilitated by, by Ipsos and Ricardo uh, we have it. Uh, we had those uh, workshops in February and in August of this year. Uh, we have the participation of 30 and 18 people, respectively, including local farmers, representatives of local environmental organizations, and local and national livestock organizations. So, as a result of this first uh, workshop, 
it was elaborated an intermediate report that compiled all the findings from the research uh, from the citizens engagement, uh, including some recommendations to support the social appropriation of knowledge. And in the second workshop, uh, the recommendation of the intermediate report were tested with citizens and the local uh, applicability was confirmed. So for this process, the key documents that were really relevant were the policy uh, public for the social appropriation of knowledge in the framework of science, technology and innovation, and the national reference framework of sustainability livestock landscapes in Colombia. Uh, with this, we were able to evaluate if the public policy for the social appropriation of knowledge uh, was fulfilled in the process of generation of knowledge in sustainable, 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 sustainable excuse me, uh, livestock farming. And this we could verify through the full field of the five principles of the policy, which are a context recognition, participation, dialogue of knowledge, transformation, and critical reflection. Um, of the second meeting, we received 19 recommendations for the community, uh, which we could use to identify the potential for wider application. The next one, please. So uh, this slide present those lessons learned by the ministry with, uh, where thanks to the meeting with all the citizens, we were able to identify areas where the ministry should take steps to improve interaction with the community. So we identified different actions and we grouped into two components those needs. Uh, uh, and the first one is the knowledge and understanding of the social appropriation and, and this first step, uh, the first step for this is to make the ministry's mission more visible and socialized throughout the territory. And the second one is the participation of the community in the process of identifying interests and needs and guaranteeing their participation. Here we could identify the need to design work plans based of knowledge of the territory of the first steps. And in order to achieve this, it is essential to include uh, the community in the process of identified interest and identify the, their needs and to guarantee their participation in the process of co-creation and implementation of the strategies. So going back to the first component, uh, according to the community feedbacks, we needed uh, to focus on three levels. The first one uh, was the presence in the territory uh, first of all, to evaluate the perception and understanding of the public policy and financing mechanisms by the community, so we can have we could validate their relevance and have a real impact in their territories. So here is very important that the community participates uh, in the construction of public policy policies, but also that we work together with them in all the stages uh, of the processes and not only in the initial ones where the information is collected. So the second one is the co-creation spaces with local communities. And uh, this is important as a strategy for the social appropriation of knowledge, but also it's an opportunity for the ministry to achieve a better articulation with the community and reduce some uh, stigmatization they have around the actions we have in territories. And the last one, the third one, is to assume the role uh, of a facilitator and articulator at the local, regional and national levels between local communities and other government entities for facilitate the resolution of problems that we could identify in the process of citizens' participation. So the second component, we also identified three levels to take actions. The first one was the, uh, the democratization strategies where the communication, the community, excuse me, expose the need to be included in these processes. And we should include people from different sectors and different points of the productive change. Uh, so the second one is the, uh, the uh, we have the community participation and the lessons here is that we must guarantee that participation and those process of co-creation and implementation of the strategies. So here 
uh, it was really important because we could talk with the community and he exposed the 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 meaning or how important it was for them incorporating follow-ups and technical support processes in all the projects and all the programs and of course including them to keeping them informed in all these stages uh, and the last one uh, is the sense of belonging it was another challenge that we could identify and is the need to make the potential of of the countryside visible, especially among young people, to encourage them to join productive activities. Um, in addition, it is really necessary to generate inputs in all these processes uh, just to be able to evaluate all the impact in social of the social initiatives in territories on a regular basis, not just at the beginning. And to close as and as an impact assessment, uh, these lessons learned apply not only for the social appropriation policy, but they all but they can be applied in other types of public policies, including including financing instruments and mechanisms to improve uh, the life in the countryside and the work with the community. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, really, really helpful and a great um, perspective on, on the work that took place in, in Colombia, much of what was featured in the video as well. Um, so really live and dynamic. And we're very grateful to institutions such as yourself and, and the other Savi as well for their, their support on this, on this work. Um, I would like now to um, turn to a different uh, policymaking perspective um, to um, Kevin Nancy. Um, who is Principal Secretary of the Department of Agriculture in Seychelles. Um, it would be great, um, Kevin, if you would be able to um, similarly share your, your uh, perspective and your experience on the, on the um, pilot um, that took place in a very different um, context and setting. So over to you, Kevin. Okay. Thank you for giving me this uh, occasion to come and talk with regards to the, the project in Seychelles and how it moves forward. And uh, I see that there are about 88 participants and maybe some of you don't know where Seychelles is. It's a small island, a small archipelago in the middle of the Indian Ocean with 115 islands, very tropical and touristic. And with regards to agriculture, and uh, agriculture is not the mainstay of the economy. The main pillar of the economy uh, is uh, tourism and fisheries. And uh, agriculture is uh, used to feed the, the, the tourism who come to the to the islands. But then still we are importing about 70% of our requirement due to land scarcity and others. So to start with, uh, the Seychelles uh, policy questions. Can I have, uh, yeah, that's it, thank you. The Seychelles policy question is, what climate smart technologies and practices are available to support an integrated approach to landscape management that address the interlinked challenges of food security and climate resilience? So uh, we've been in liaison with, uh, with uh, uh, Ipsos and Ricardo, and with that regards, we did have uh, research conducted by Ricardo in collaboration with the Seychelles Science Technology and innovation of Seychelles. And uh, there were expert group to develop the questions and uh, the evidence. Then uh, the work continued in uh, January 2023, whereby uh, there were two citizen engagement workshop, which was facilitated by the local consultancy, Mr. Morel and the team, and also supported by Ipsos in, uh, I've just mentioned January, 2023, and the participant covered farmers, household growers, and uh, agricultural students. In that uh, citizen engagement workshop, we want we, we included farmers mainly in the rural areas. Uh, those are the farmers who are the ones who uh, contribute a lot to the agricultural sector with regards to uh, crop production and also providing uh, food for the for the island. And then we have the interim report that compile and presented evidence, including the prioritizations of key technologies and barriers for their uptakes. This report uh, is very important and because it shows 
the work that was done uh, with regards to the two research and the workshops that was held. And uh, recently, in August this year, we've had the stakeholders workshop, which was facilitated by Ipsos and Ricardo. That was, like I've mentioned, in August 2023, uh, which is to help explore barriers and identify solutions and follow up reports to inform uh, the Seychelles agricultural strategy. Because uh, we are now working on the on the Seychelles agricultural strategy. Anyway, it's, it is in the final stage now. And while we are doing the strategy, we have the, the help of uh, Ipsos and Ricardo so that uh, to, to assess what uh, is required in the strategy. Because uh, the strategy is uh, with regards to our mission, ensuring Seychelles and nutrition security and sovereignty for the people of Seychelles. That's a broad mission. And uh, we have our vision of uh, improved food security and uh, economically sustainable import substitution and create of avenues to encourage more consumption of local farm products. Like I've mentioned, Seychelles is a small island. So uh, uh, we are not spared from the adverse effect of climate change. Uh, we have uh, on the farm which are on the coast, you have seawater intrusions and uh, the one which are on the mountains, you have erosions and all of these climate change need to be included into the into the uh, the strategy uh, about uh, climate proofing agriculture and seizures. And nobody is the small island who are much vulnerable when it comes to, to climate change because of limited resources. And uh, with regards to the project learning and potential for wider application, uh, we address the issue of uh, policy questions that is required to be developed and with regards to the sub sections also. Because we have a list, uh, a list of of questions in, uh, in in the policies, and when we met with the farmers, which is good that we have those workshops, we are able to uh, talk to them, share their views. Because uh, the government, uh, uh, we are we, we cannot just write a policy without um, in, without uh, in liaison, without liaising with the farmers. We have to do it in collaboration with the farmers, <laughs> and also the sorry and also the, the expert group and the stakeholders. Number two, the expert group, with regards to challenging to assemble all experts together. This was one of the challenge, but we managed to have uh, one room with uh, most of the of the experts and so as to have their views. Even uh, Seychelles is small, but still we have uh, three main islands, Prawn and Ladig, whereby we have uh, a number of farmers on those islands. And they need to be included also because you cannot do uh, a policy or a strategy for only farmers on the main island because they also have their specific uh, disadvantages and uh, so uh, that we have to work on, especially transportation. Uh, when uh, we have uh, our uh, raw materials for agriculture, all your inputs, your fertilizer, your seeds, and also even uh, your animal feed, it is always more expensive for them because we, they have to be transported from the main island to the other island. That's why we have some uh, uh, subsidies or some mechanism so as to help the farmers on the on the inner islands. With regard to citizen engagement, the farmers, they really appreciate the opportunity to have their say because like I've mentioned, we have those farmers from the rural area of Valdado and uh, they did participate very actively, huh? and they contributed a lot with regards to what uh, what they want to have uh, in, uh, in in the final strategy, and that's why uh, we are now working with the expert to go into the uh, final validation so that we can move along with that, and also mention that uh, it was part of or in the process of the of the uh, strategic tools with regards to the follow up. Uh, stakeholders workshop. This is about bringing together the government officials, academia, farming communities uh, together with uh, to ident identify the solutions. And uh, we have the School of Agriculture, SIA, and also we have the University of Seychelles, and most our uh, farm workers, and also the workers for the Department of Agriculture, they come from the school and from the you know, University of Seychelles. 
That's why we must uh, bring them along while they are still uh, within the institution so that they can help and uh, bringing the, the idea, bringing new blood, how they want to see agriculture, what is the problem affecting the youth. And uh, as uh, uh, Rachel is aware while she was in Seychelles, the farming population is uh, a bit old. Eh? Even the, the workers at the department. So we want to make agriculture attractive. And this is in the, in the strategy also. Make it attractive so that we can have the youth to come and take over while uh, we move out. And uh, this is uh, the way forward, actually. And uh, also the policy impact. So it was uh, informed development of the Seychelles agricultural strategy. That is the impact with regards to the various uh, sectors, which is also um, uh, included in the strategy. And this is, uh, this is a very, very important as you have, uh, because agriculture is not a standalone uh, uh, department. You have others, you have the Department of Tourism, you have fisheries, and all of those have to be interlinked, especially tourism. Now we have uh, uh, agri-tourism. Agri -tourism. We also have agroforestry. These are the new uh, subjects which we want to bring in agriculture. We don't want to make it only uh, conventional or traditional agriculture. We want to include other aspects of it. So we call it the diversification, which is very important. Diversification is important because we want to see agriculture as a foreign exchange retention because of the size, it is difficult, difficult to make it a foreign exchange earner, but it will become a foreign exchange retention because uh, Seychelles, like I mentioned, we cannot compete with the big uh, importers uh, on the, out there, the big market. So we have to find our niche market and uh, find our strategy and use the brand Seychelles so that we can sell the product. With regards to wider application that is considering the potential application to other climate agendas across Seychelles government, that is including uh, transport and land use. So with regards to, to, to energy, I may say, we have uh, the program for renewable energy in agriculture, because we know that agriculture is, uses a lot of energy, and also the energy which is being used in Seychelles. We are more involved with uh, photovoltaic cells, and also transportation of hybrid vehicles, which use less uh, fossil fuels. And uh, this is the way forward. And uh, the only way forward for agriculture in Seychelles is by uh, having uh, new technologies, innovations in the sector. This is the only way forward because traditional agriculture will not work in Seychelles, uh, taking into account the limited land and also the limited facilities that we have. And uh, I will now thank you because I uh, I have uh, gone well over my five minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you um, so much, Kevin. And I'm delighted today. We we have been experiencing some technical um, challenges um, onboarding Elizabeth Adobe Rosa, who has been able to join us. I'm delighted to say that Elizabeth is able to join us. She might need to go off camera, um, but let's see how it how it goes in terms of um, the events and, and audience. Do bear with us. This is very common when it comes to global work. You know, people have different levels of internet connectivity. It kind of comes and goes. Uh, uh, so Elizabeth is a soil scientist at the Kenya Agriculture and Livestock Research Organization, CARO. And we've done some really exciting work in, in Kenya on the issue of data sharing. So over to you, Elizabeth. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. So the, the, as Rema has said, my name is Elizabeth, and I'm going to give you, yeah, I'm going to share with you some insights from uh, what has happened so far in Kenya. Yeah, the discussion will basically uh, follow follow what we what we are asked to to share our insights on in terms of uh, what was the policy question, what we learned, and the impact on policy making. And uh, so one of the things that we did as Kenya was that. Uh, we held several online meetings to share a level of expectations for climate smart agriculture. But uh, for us in Kenya, we have a strategy. We have so many policy documents, which we have. And so we had to have quite a, a series of meetings to discuss and level from all parties, the, the scientists, the, the stakeholders in country and uh, both Ricardo and uh, Ipsos. And so after that, we also held a one day workshop where we had uh, uh, stakeholders come in from uh, different uh, institutions in the private sector and government and uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, NGOs to refine the policy question. 
And after that, we had uh, uh, an online meeting to agree to agree on the approach that we'll be able to to use to implement this uh, uh, work. So we our policy question focused on a CSA policy implementation and monitoring. And uh, basically, we asked ourselves what are the barriers and enable us to sharing data regarding and uh, and using data regarding and, uh, we, we, in which we formulated uh, a research question, which is opportunities and barriers in terms of accessing and sharing data. There, there's a reasoning behind the policy gap in terms of, of, of the, 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 data, the research question in terms of policy data gap. And uh, I guess this is uh, relates to almost every, you know, when it comes to policy implementation, we have uh, several policies in the ministry and all these policies require to be monitored. And so there's a demand for data, which uh, information and follow up and monitoring. And uh, this there's a gap in all that. And there's also a lot of data out there that can be used to 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 monitor these policies or to monitor implementation or to 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 to, to define the policy and see how it can be refined. But all these need to be harmonized. And uh, also, we have a clear lack of feedback loop on policy impacts among stakeholders implementing CSA activities. Government shows up to say, "Okay, this is a policy implement. Everybody is implementing. Nobody is checking on the other. There's duplication. There is a you know there's a lot of things happening in that space." And so that is one of the things that informed that uh, gap. And then there's a very poor attribution of policy impact. Not many, it's very difficult to pinpoint what, what is the impact of the CSA policy when it comes to, to either the GHG issues, the climate change issues, or even food security. And the lessons that we learned, uh, so far, we have learned so far in this engagement is that uh, it's, a very, it's very difficult to adapt international initiatives and objectives to a lot. We have had to do a lot of leveling on the real value of this tool in terms of the policy processes. And so that has, uh, you know, it is the reality that it's a must for you to really engage with the wider uh, stakeholders to identify the real policy need. What do you, the, the policy research, uh, the policy research need. And then also it, it was, uh, it, it, you know, just even accepting the process that is being taken. It, it was a big uh, kind of, uh, you know, different opinions in terms of the value of this citizen engagement in the policy processes. Is it speculative? Is it in Kenya? Unfortunately, our 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 relationship with Ipsos is that it gives us opinion polls around uh, politics, and they just never go right. And so, when you talk to even professionals, they are a bit like, "Okay, this isn't participation. Is it an opinion poll? What is it?" And so, defining that value was quite an issue, and uh, you know, it was it was quite a lesson to learn to you know get people to understand, to embrace, to appreciate the tool that uh, you know we're going to use uh, in this work. So in one of the things that we did, which is also part of the lesson, is that we, we were able to have a discussions and a, a tired uh, engagement approach because we realized that there are quite a number of stakeholders in this space. As uh, the Ministry of Agriculture has a multi-stakeholder platform where different stakeholders engage on matters CSA in a, a CSA. And so all they, they're different, they, 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 they're categorized in a different way. And so all this is what uh, we discussed and uh, agree that uh, one of the approach that we'll have is to have different uh, views from the different stakeholders. So we had a tire of farmers, we need their views. We have the people who provide uh, services, extension services or work directly with farmers or generate information for farmers. And we have, um, you know, intermediary institutions, we have... Um, the, the subnational, you know, we have a devolved system in Kenya, so we have the national and the subnational, and agriculture that devolved function. So we need stakeholders at that, policy makers at that level, at subnational level, and in all this, basically, we will have to we have, we have to understand what data is being reported or shared or is needed, who is responsible for sharing it, when should it be shared, where should the data be reported, who, where do they take that data when they have, data they have, where do they take it, and why is this being uh, shared or reported. And one of the things that uh, came out clearly in the stakeholder, uh, the, the initial uh, stakeholder workshop that we had, was that most of the stakeholders there had no clue why any data was being uh, collected, and uh, and so that's why it was it's very key that we we tire this and have to be able to engage so that we can be able to, to 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 generate enough information for enough data that can inform our policy implementation. Yeah, so so far we envision that uh, if we go ahead and implement the approach that we have uh, we 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 have uh, kind of adopted as a, as a team is that we'll be able to 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 generate quality data from this process which can inform formulation of approaches that enable you know working directly with different stakeholders to provide data that underpins the bylaws because we have quite a number of policies where they need to be monitored the people need to provide feedback 
And then we also need to develop uh, decision support tools for farmers to manage CSA activities. And also we need to improve awareness of the CSA policies and how they interact. And uh, you know, there are quite a number of policies that sit a domicile in agriculture, a, a domicile in, in, in different departments, environment, uh, you know, different departments that talk about data, talk about rights. Our constitution itself is big on participation and individual rights. So how do they interact? And we hope that this process will be able to help us, you know, address some of the, of, of this issue if we successfully implement it. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much to all those, um, to all our speakers. That was that was really really great and um, uh, really interesting to happen to hear what happened in both Seychelles and Colombia. Um, the wider um, uh, examples from the World Bank um, and the, the 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 discussions that are being held in in Kenya at the moment. Um, I think we were going to have a brief Q and A now, but I'm aware that we're a little bit short of time. So I think maybe if we go into the questions and answers, and Richard, I'm going to send us give us both a challenge now, um, which is to to give our, our present our slides, um, which is very much on lessons. If we can just move to the next slide, we're also going to try and answer any questions in the chat that have come up at the same time. But please, if those questions, there's a question there for World Bank, there's a question there about UK examples, um, Sarah, maybe if you can answer in, in the Q&A wherever you, wherever you can, and we'll bring other things up into the, to the overall learning. Um, so, so one of the things we highlighted earlier on is like really important in this is, is that there's a legacy from this, that it's not just a one off project, but that it goes on to to provide a real opportunity across the globe. But also that there was learning as we went through. We we built in quite a sort of high level evaluation is probably too, uh, too sophisticated a term, really, but sort of ongoing learning where we had learning logs and we changed things as we moved um, as we moved on. So if we could just go to the next slide, please. So one thing that was highlighted at the beginning was how, how are we going to measure success in this? So this actually came out from one of our steering groups. I think it was perhaps our, our colleagues in the non-pilot countries in, in Italy and, and Jamaica who raised this. So how are you going to measure success? And so we looked against the, these three headings around citizen engagement, science and knowledge and policy making about what, what means success. And there was a question in, in the Q&A um, about... Um, about how early citizens are involved in this process. And this is sort of coming, I guess it is coming from a policymaker's point of view that the policymaker identifies a challenge, does some evidence to identify if there's any, any uh, if, if there's already evidence out there and then goes to citizens. But there's no reason why the citizens can't go to the policymakers and say, we've got these issues. So these are really how we've, we've highlighted across the three about the citizens engaged, citizens have a greater awareness. Thought that was really interesting finding earlier about um, that the opportunity to deliberate is actually informing people more than other, other information. So just to uh, move on to the next slide. So in terms of looking at our lessons learned, we're looking at the governance side and then looking at the actual sort of more policies, policy and, and scientific evidence side, and then coming finally to citizen engagement. So, so on the governance, this is really about how countries take this on, how, how, they, how they manage it, how they um, you know, achieve the, the outcomes. And the first thing is about being really clear about why we're doing this and what the benefits are. And I think that was something that we learned through this project that it was initially set up as net zero, but from um, particularly input from Seychelles and Colombia, it was, you know, climate resilience adaptation is much, you know, is, is as much of a priority in, in those countries. Being really clear on who's doing what, when and why, I guess that also uh, that applies to all, all, all projects, but I guess something like this, where you've got a different, different strands looking at, at engaging citizens, engaging experts, looking at the evidence, linking back to policymakers, having really clear roles and responsibilities. Political will is really important um, throughout this project. Um, we've been working on for 18, 18 months now. We've had 
you know, changes of governments, changes of members of staff, changes on in Ipsos, changes in the UK government, changes in Ricardo. Um, yeah, and on the sec next point, we've actually had general elections, which can have really big impacts. So actually having that strong commitment that isn't just an individual. So when that individual moves, so we had, um, you know, within Seychelles, it's moved between government departments and that's been really successful. So it's just that there, there is that overall commitment or otherwise, if, if it's just individuals who are keen, it'll, it'll, move, it'll uh, yeah, it, there'll be no momentum when they move on. And just the basic stuff around, um, you know, sort of PM and, and admin arrangements is really crucial when you've got a lot of different people, timelines, contacts, et cetera. Um, if I could just move over to uh, Richard now. Thank you. Many thanks, Rachel. And uh, many thanks to the countries because I thought your presentations were excellent and I'm going to try and do them justice by providing an overall summary of lessons in relation to the way you've gone or about uh, applying science in the process. Um, so forgive me for it being very short. Uh, I'll cover these three areas, developing the scope of the policy question and defining the research questions, informing the citizen engagement through accessible research outputs, and collaboratively de developing recommendations with experts and policy makers. Yeah, so regarding developing the scope of the policy question and defining the research questions. Um, you know, we worked with the three governments, Colombia, Seychelles, Kenya, uh, to fine tune their policy questions and in doing so also work with experts from those countries and subsequently developed research questions for which answers might be found. It's all too easy actually to come up with a policy question that's rather too broad or research questions certainly that are rather too broad um, um, which it, it, it won't be possible uh, to find answers. We found that the most important aspects of the approach include being flexible, utilising the expert knowledge and engaging with a range of stakeholders to reflect uh, the differing contexts, starting positions in terms of how uh, countries have developed their policy questions um, and as well as uh, different governments, uh, governance structures and requests for different government departments and stakeholders to be involved. So for example, uh, in Colombia, we've heard the development of the policy question was conducted online through a series of engagements coordinated with the expert group and with the policy makers. In the Seychelles, there was a more defined policy question which required less facilitation um, to achieve actionable um, an actionable question and set of sub-questions for research. In Kenya, uh, the development of the policy question was facilitated through an in-person workshop with national and county government, NGOs and civil society. In relation to informing the citizen engagement through accessible research outputs, we found that with a variety of stakeholders involved, it's really essential to produce research outputs in an accessible and applicable form um, that, that's relevant to everyone, citizens, academic experts, and policy makers. Quite a tall order, but really important. Successfully conveying the key findings ensures that feedback from the citizen engagement can provide local validation and evidence to fill or help fill uh, gaps in that evidence and to refine the research. On the slide, there's a screenshot um, of findings from the Seychelles research, which were summarized um, in relation to the 16 climate smart technologies in 16 slides. A lot of information condensed very simply uh, in that tabulation. Uh, and finally, regarding collaboratively developing recommendations with experts and policymakers, we found that a collaborative approach helped to ensure that the research actually addressed the policy questions. I mean, that's pretty important. And by presenting the overall research and citizen engagement findings to the group of experts and policymakers, input, common understanding and commitment to recommendations that can address the policy questions was secured 
And that's, you know, well, it's been fantastic. In the Seychelles, for example, we heard from, from Kevin uh, Nancy, um, an in-person workshop brought together key stakeholders from the Ministry of Agriculture, from the expert group and local farmers uh, previously involved in the citizen engagement. By using the research to identify key barriers to the uptake of the climate smart technologies, the group's been able to identify key actionable solutions that are actually informing the new agriculture strategy. So that's a real success. And I think that's that's it. So back to you, Rachel. Thank you, Richard. So uh, next slide. Please, we just have a couple more. So, yeah, just going back onto the citizens' engagement. So, um, citizens really welcome the opportunity to have their say at an early stage of policy development. Um, there's a, there's a, a great recording from um, Seychelles in in January when the where the, uh, the the national TV was talking to a couple of the farmers who attended, and they were absolutely over the moon to have actually been able to say publicly to the government what they wanted. They said. Uh, Everybody knows what we're saying now because we're not, we're 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 on TV saying it as well. So there was yeah great involvement there. Um, important to focus on on those relevant communities of interest. So with Colombia, it was particularly around livestock and Seychelles um, linked to agriculture, but also bringing in a mix of citizens. So so as we said, you know farmers from different areas, the the, the bigger farmers, the smaller farmers, and also those those students. Um, there, there's a question in the, in in the chat around. Um, you know how to how do you involve people it needs quite a bit of time and, and it does need time to properly debate the issues you know there, there are trade-offs involved here is asking people to get their heads around different concepts um so and, and also having you know good design of, of complex information and materials so there was a question about how do we compensate people or have we in this project and yes we have compensated people to attend so to be more inclusive Again, in relate to inclusivity is that importance of, of unconveying technical comp concepts in a way that, that non-technical audience can understand, whether that's climate smart um, technologies, right, whether it's around data, um, whether it's actually around like some sort of, some of the climate impacts. Um, and also one thing we hadn't sort of intended to do at the outset, and so a real sign of learning was that we had the, the policy question, the, the, the evidence work, the citizen engagement, the experts then re re had another think through with the, the with the uh, outputs from from the citizen engagement, and then we actually got everybody together again, and that worked really really well in the Seychelles and in Colombia. So we had those those same farmers that we talked to in January actually talking directly to government department and to the to the academics. Um, so just next slide, please, and I think this is our penultimate one. I'm not going to go through through this in detail. This is this is quite high level, and it's it's really around the the, the the general learnings and benefits from from involved from public engagement in in policy development so increased awareness diverse perspectives improving decision making increased trust and legitimacy and actually um being equitable in the development of those policies and i think if if rima is um if you can speak rima if you just want to give a couple of closing remarks and just check if there's any further q a that would be great I mean, just in terms of the closing remarks, I want to, to really say a huge thank you to everyone. Um, I mean, there's so many people to, to thank. I um, want to thank our policymakers. Um, thank you to the World Bank. Um, thank you to the Department of Energy, Security and Net Zero for making this work possible. Um, the Colombian government, Seychelles government in, uh, in Kenya, the Kenyan government in Cairo for all their work. Um, lots of organisations such as the Agrosavia in Colombia, um, who've, who've really been really helpful in supporting the work, and our working groups in the different countries who have helped really shape and steer and offer input and advice. Um, the really important thing for me to stress at this stage is how brilliant our extensive project team has been in supporting this work so um it's been an impetus and ricardo collaboration working with um with the governments of the different countries as part of a global side partnership and um you know it's not just this team that's on this call it's uh, a huge shout out to to colleagues in in kenya colleagues in colombia Seychelles. I know many of you are with us, so I just want to say um, a big thanks to to you and for everything that you've been doing um, and stress stress that it has been a real collaborative effort.
And the last thing I wanted to say is um, a quick reminder of the toolkit, which is being published, and we will be sharing a link um, to that and other resources um, very, very shortly. Um, and uh, last but absolutely not least, a huge thank you to you and a thank you to the RSA for um, doing a great job um, in, in hosting this this event. Um, uh, take care. I hope you you go well and you you enjoy the rest of your uh, rest of your day. Um, take care.